we're gonna we're wrapping up our series through Nehemiah. The point of Nehemiah was to to learn from Nehemiah from the scripture about how to to rebuild something, which is in large part what we're doing. Okay, and so today we're gonna wrap it up with three final lessons from the book of Nehemiah, and they are commitment, rejoicing, and accountability. Commitment, rejoicing, and accountability. And so that's where we're going today. I'm gonna pray for us, and then we'll we'll wrap up our series this morning. Lord Jesus, um, I ask for grace now as we gather here, Lord, um, speak to our hearts. Lord, uh, bring, uh, as we reflect, Lord, on this series and as we look forward to what you have for us in the future, God, I pray that you would just fill us with joy, fill us with anticipation, fill us with earnestness and desire to see your name magnified here in Dodge County. To see you recreate in us, God, a church that, that deep down we all know that we can be. I pray that we might see lost people saved. And this uh, community transformed by the power of the gospel and by the power of your grace. And that a new work of your grace, as we talked about, your grace finds us, God. It meets us. It's everywhere. It's in the, it's on the mountaintops. It's in the valley. It's in the mundane and it's in the extraordinary. Your grace is everywhere. Your grace has been with us every step of this journey and we just we and all we can say is we need more God more grace to walk us through this that you may be glorified in it and it's in Christ's name we pray amen um, if you have a Bible you can turn to Nehemiah 10 that's where we're going to start this morning but um, as we've walked into Nehemiah again I just want to remind ourselves where we've been some things that we've learned that I've learned from this series I've learned the importance of brokenness. That is a holy discontentment with where we are, which is the initial seed that can blossom into change. I've learned the importance of prayer. That is any change worth having has to be wrought by God and God's power is accessed through prayer. Only accessed through prayer. When we're crying and begging out for God to help and for his leadership, that's when he works. I've learned the importance of realism. Right, that sometimes you just got, you got to see what's there, what's really there, and not what you wish were there. Learn the importance of confidence. Confidence that God is able to do what, what we cannot do. So when you look out at the future and you think, you know, <laughs> humanly speaking, this is impossible. You look at the Red Sea. This is impossible. You look at the Jordan River. This is impossible. You look at the walls of Jericho. This is impossible. Until God shows up. Confidence that God can do what we cannot do. Learn the importance of teamwork, right? Everybody willing, everybody willing to pick up a sword and a trowel and pick a part of the wall and get to work to do together what we cannot do alone. We've learned the importance of determination. That is expecting opposition, expecting obstacles, expecting the devil to try to get his foot into whatever God's doing, but refusing to be thrown off course. We've learned about the, the, the importance of righteousness within and without that we can't expect to God bless sin. So we must hold high gospel standards and keep one another accountable to them. We've learned the importance of, uh, 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 or the blessing of joy of those who are appointed to stay the course. Those who, those who are called to the, that moment, they get their name listed there in that genealogy or called to that moment to be enrolled of in the people of God called for that time and that moment to do this work of God. And that's us. And we've learned the importance of taking an immovable stand on God's word. They came and they read the scripture together all day long. And the weight of it rested heavily upon their hearts. And they recommitted themselves to the scripture and to the truth, being willing to follow it wherever it leads. And so now as we round out Nehemiah, we're going to see three final points. Number one, rebuilders commit to not neglect the house of their God. Rebuilders commit to not neglect the house of their God. Number two, rebuilders rejoice in what God has done. Rebuilders rejoice in what God has done. And finally, number three, rebuilders embrace accountability to stay the course. Rebuilders embrace accountability to stay the course. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning, and we're going to begin 
from the end of chapter 10. So if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's word. We're going to begin from Nehemiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 35. Verse 35. This is what it says. It says, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of the ground and the first fruits of all fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine and the oil to the priests, to the chambers of the house of our God, and to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all of our towns where we labor. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes. And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Word of God. You may be seated. Okay, so last time we talked about how Nehemiah chapter 9 there, and you can just glance there, is essentially a long prayer of repentance. And they recount God's continued faithfulness and his righteousness, even his righteousness in condemning Israel for her sin. So when God exiled Israel out of the land for their continued rebellion and idolatry, they, they affirm that God was righteous in doing that because they were, in fact, a stiff-necked and rebellious people. And they mourned over that in this prayer, and they recommitted themselves to obeying God's law by, as we, as you see at the end of verse 10 there, by making, by making a covenant with God, by essentially renewing the covenant with, with God. Okay, so you can see there at the end of chapter 10 that they are making a covenant before God and one another. Okay, and the list of people, so at the beginning of chapter 10 is a list of all those names, which I'm not going to read. And you have, and but those names are, are, are what? Those names are the names of the people who are essentially making this covenant with God, right? And so if you think about it, what, what is happening is that these people are the ones who are willing to set their public seal on a covenant before God, saying we are making a covenant with God uh, to which we are to be held accountable, right? That's like when you get married, right? When you get married, you, you have to have a witness. Why do you have to have a witness? So that somebody can say, I saw them make that vow. So that you can be held accountable, supposed to be, for the vows that you make, Right? And so the, these names are these people setting the seal to the covenant that they, that they would be faithful to God, right? And, and then in the remainder of uh, uh, chapter 10 there, which part of which we read, right, is that they lay down very specific ways in which they're going to keep this covenant. So if you look in chapter 10, verse 28 and following, you see there that all these things that they commit to do, and one of the big things that they recommit to do is to make sure to bring the tithe to the, the Levites. So the, 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 uh, the tithe, the tenth of their produce, remember, in reality and in Jewish conception, of course, but in all reality, right? Anything we have is a gift from God. The Bible says that even it is God who gives you the ability to gain wealth. So if God, if so, if you have anything, it's a gift from God. If you have a job, it's a gift from God. If your job is profitable, that's a gift from God. Okay? And so for them to give a tenth of that is just simply saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you have given to me. And, and then so a tithe would go to the Levites because the Levites had the broad job of taking care of the tabernacle and the temple, and then a tithe of a tithe, a tenth of a tenth, would go to the priests, you know, who is a much smaller group who specifically made the offerings and the sacrifices and things like that. But the Levites and the priests worked together in service of the tabernacle and service of God. And so a lot of their commitments and obligations were saying, we are going to commit 
to obey what God commanded in the law. These are commandments in the law given on Mount Sinai in, in order to not neglect the house of their God, which of course was important because that's the center of worship for the life of the nation. Okay? And so I think that last verse there, verse 39, is key. They say all these things because their commitment, the covenant that they're making is that we will not neglect the house of our God. So now we know that uh, the new covenant, in the new covenant, right, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Okay? Jesus said that was going to happen because the Jews rejected their own Messiah. Okay? And in the new covenant... We don't worship God through the blood of goats and bulls, the author of Hebrews says, because God himself has provided a sacrifice once for all for sin, the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ. So we don't need a temple. We don't need to offer sacrifices because God has accomplished what all those other sacrifices were just pointers to by the giving of his own son as a sacrifice for sin, who rose from the dead, who was seated on high, who is the high priest of a new covenant. Okay, a new covenant. So, so now the, the, the temple of God in the new covenant is not a place. It's a people. We, the people of God, the church, capital C, the universal church is the temple of God, the dwelling place of God by the spirit. Because when you believe in Jesus, when you truly repent of your sins and believe in Christ in your heart, the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you and dwells within you. And collectively, we are bearers, possessors. We are the body of Christ. We are the temple, the Bible says, of the living God. But just as the ministry of the temple with all its priestly duties was supported by the people, so the ministry of the church is empowered and enabled by the generosity of the people. And so I talked about this already, so I'm not going to belabor this, but I'm just going to say that that we as the people of God give, we support, we commit to the work of God with our giving of our resources, yes, and our time and our energy and our sweat and our prayers. Okay, we give to support the work of the ministry to the to the worship and praise of God, just like the Israelites did in the support of the temple. And so that means that we as a church, right, the church, I believe, is meant to be a conduit, right? A conduit of God's grace and yes, of God's resources to the work of the ministry to the glory of God. So the church is, you know what a conduit is, right? Things go through it. A conduit exists, so things go through it. If something gets stuck in a conduit, the, the purpose of the whole conduit is ruined because the whole point is for something to go through it. The church is a conduit, not a collecting pool. There's a difference, right? When, when God, when Jesus told the parable about how a master gives his servant sums of money, what did he tell the servant who just kept it, hid it, and did nothing with it? You lazy servant! You should have took what I've given you and invested it, used it, put it in this, put it in that, invested it, used it for kingdom purposes so that when I returned, I would have investment. And of course, for the church, that means spiritual investment, right? We take God's resources and we invest them not in the stock market, but in spiritual things, which are going to long-term yield much better returns. Especially if you've been watching the news, much better returns. Okay? And so we have the privilege of being part of the new work of God, right? So, and in this new work of God, there's going to be needs. And I've already said that, right? You've seen Shark Tank? You ever seen Shark Tank? You know what I'm talking about? You go before these wealthy people and you pitch your idea, okay, that you've worked your whole life on and they tell you how dumb it was. And, um, <laughs> and, and, but you're, you're, you're seeking what? You're trying to get investment because to, to launch a, a new work, you got to have some upfront capital to get it off the ground in the hopes that what? That you'll, you'll be able to have future, much greater future returns, right? And so that's what we're talking about here. We're saying that initially there's going to be some upfront things to get this thing off the ground in anticipation and, and, and hope of, of future returns, spiritual returns. And that's what we're looking at. But that last sentence I think is crucial. The committer, the rebuilders commit not to neglect the house of their God. And so in our hearts, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commitment. We're going to see this thing through. 
We're going to see it through to the end. Number one, rebuilders commit not to neglect the house of God. Number two, rebuilders rejoice in what God has done. Rebuilders rejoice in what God has done. Uh, turn over to chapter 12 there, uh, verse 30. Chapter 12, verse 30. It says, And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate. And then the other, and then if you jump down to verse 38 there, jump down to verse 38, it says the other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north. And I followed them with half of the people on the wall above the tower of the ovens to the broad wall. Okay, jump down to verse 40. Okay, verse 40. So both choirs of those who gave thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, jump down to verse 43, <laughs> verse 43, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God made them rejoice with great joy, and the women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. So I just pulled out some verses there to, to get the main thrust of what that was saying there. But they they see what God has done. The wall is completed. They form two great choirs. They go opposite directions on the wall. They both meet up together at the temple and they worship God. They praise God. They rejoice what God has done. So they brought the people together, especially those who sang and play instruments. So there's biblical precedent, okay? You know, the Bible talks about loud crashing cymbals, y'all. That's in the Bible, okay? And so, so they're praising God, all right? They ascend the wall, and they gave thanks, and they offered sacrifices. But what I, what I want to focus on here is verse 43. Verse 43, chapter 12, verse 43. It says, they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. Look at this. For God... Had made, had made them rejoice with great joy. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. Joy is a gift from God. Joy is a gift from God. When we act in faith and obedience, that's a gift from God. That's God's grace at work in our lives to step out in faith and step out in obedience. And when you step out in faith and you step out in obedience and you have done in your heart what you know God has called you to do and you have participated with God in a work that he is doing in the world and you look back at that, there is no feeling like that. It's joy. And it's a gift from God. They could look back, and that's the thing, right? They look back. On the wall, they can literally walk on top of the wall. The wall that those guys over there said a fox could break down if it ran up on it. Now they're walking on top of the wall. They're walking around the wall. Then they're looking, they're looking at, they're looking under their feet. They're looking at the great wall around the city and they can say, and they, and just in their hearts, they know God did this. I didn't do this. God built this wall. There's no way we could have done it without him. But by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us with a sword and a trowel, we built the wall and God did it. And then when it's all said and done, they can look back and they can look at the wall and they can rejo rejoice with great joy because God had made them rejoice with great joy. I'm praying for a lot of rejoicing to take place in the coming months and years. When the sword and trowel are in your hand, it can get discouraging. But one day, you look back and you say, look what God has done. Look what God has done. God had made them rejoice with great joy. I'm praying that God would do what Cottondale what liberty or any combination of the two are humanly incapable of doing. I'm praying God would do it.
that we would become what we always deep down know we, we, we can be, we could be. And not because, not because we were great, but because God is great. And because we were just willing to say, you know what, Jesus, like Peter, you know what, Jesus, if you tell me to come out the boat, I'll do it. I ain't stepping out of this boat unless you tell me to, because that's, that's a death sentence. But if you tell me to come out the boat, I'll come out. And then you walk on water, because Jesus is holding you up. So, so God has called us out of the boat. And I, I can, I don't, you might not feel it, but I, t- I feel like I'm walking on water. Literally. Walking on water. Only God is holding this up. But hey, God is good, y'all. And He is faithful and He's powerful. And so we just keep praying and, and, and rejoice of what He's done so far. And I anticipate a lot more rejoicing to come. So number one, rebuilders commit not to neglect the house of their God. Number two, rebuilders rejoice what God has done. Number three, rebuilders embrace accountability to stay the course. Rebuilders embrace accountability to stay the course. Chapter 13. Look first at verses 6 through 12. 6 through 12. This is what Nehemiah says. He says, while this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all of Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. Okay, jump down to verse 15. In those days, I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on the city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Now jump down to verse 23. Verse 23. In those days also I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. And I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. All right. So we have to this point detailed what rebuilding requires and what rebuilders do. Okay. And so this is the last point of this sermon series. I hope you'll go back and you'll reflect on this series and think about some of the principles that we have drawn out and ask yourself, what's my role in this? What's my role? You know, you can think of it like this way. What's the portion of the wall that God has for me? What's the part of the wall that God is calling me to pick up my sword and my trowel and do for his glory? So that's what I want us to think about. Now, as we round off the book of Nehemiah, we get to this last chapter. And if you've ever read that before, and we, we, we read, you know, some of the, 
some of the choice parts right there. Okay? It's a doozy. What we, what we, it's, it's interesting, it's instructive, it's saddening. What do we see? We see Nehemiah throughout the book of Nehemiah, right? What's the point? I keep coming back to this because you got to understand where it fits in in the Bible. Nehemiah was God's appointed man, and this is God's, God just has a way with this because it all ultimately points to Jesus, right? God has a chosen man for different seasons to, to, to accomplish his work among his people, okay? It ultimately points to Jesus, okay? Nehemiah was God's appointed man for this time to rebuild the wall, but remember, he had a more important work to do than rebuild the wall, and what was that? It was to bring spiritual renewal to the people, right? Because of what? Because why did the wall get torn down in the first place? Sin and rebellion against God. So if they rebuild the wall and they keep on sinning against God, what's going to happen? It happened in 70 AD. When the temple was destroyed by the Romans. But from a, a, a canonical perspective, what is happening, right? Nehemiah, Nehemiah goes back to Babylon, okay, for a, a season. And while he's gone, you know, when the, when the cat's away, the mouse come out to play, they always say. He comes back, right? And what do they do? Literally, they have a guy who's squatting in the place where they're supposed to bring the tithe. Just chilling, hanging out, got his furniture there. Okay? And they stopped the tide. Literally, the very thing they had made a covenant with God to start doing. And so they had made this solemn covenant. They signed their name to it, and then they break it. And to put it mildly, Nehemiah is livid. So, again, from a canonical perspective, what do we have, Right? We got sin entered the world. God's going to fix this problem through a man and his family named Abraham. Okay? He, he makes a promise. His descendants go down into Egypt. They come out of a great multitude. God saves them from slavery in Egypt. He, these ten plagues, he, he rebukes Egypt and all their idolatry and all their wickedness and all their false gods. He leads them out of slavery through the Red Sea. He appears to them in, in, in cloud and fire. He, they hear his voice from Mount Sinai. He gives them the law and the commandments. He, he, he brings them to the very cusp of the land and they rebel. He feeds them food from heaven and they rebel. He brings them into the land and gives it to them and they rebel. They want a king. He gives them a king. And they rebel. You see a pattern here? He exiles them out of their land for their rebellion. He shows them unbelievable grace and mercy and brings them back. And they rebel. Nehemiah, now think about this. Nehemiah really, his, like in terms of the storyline of the Old Testament, right? That, that's the, that's as late as you go, right? He, Nehemiah is essentially, historically, is the end of the Old Testament, okay? You, you have a period of about 400 years of prophetic silence. And then Jesus shows up. So when you're reading the book of Nehemiah, what are you thinking? You're thinking, okay, okay, they rebel, they rebel, they rebel, but okay, look, God brought them back. God's faithful. God kept his promise. Things are going to get better now. Right? But it turns out that even after the exile and even after the restoration from the exile, Israel's fundamental problem is still not resolved. You see that? Their hearts are still hard. The restoration is incomplete because the people are still unable to be the true people of God that he 
calls them to be. Because the problem with Israel wasn't out there. It was in here. So Nehemiah closes out the end of the Old Testament story. And what are we left with? You, you kind of just left hanging in like, what is happening? Because you get to the end of Nehemiah and you, you, have, a, you have a rebellious people. And in fact, if you want, if you want to read the very last book in the Old Testament, go read the book of Malachi. And if you get back, here, I don't have it, but I'm just going to read it for you guys, show you how, how on a cheery note the Old Testament ends. Okay. These are the last verses of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. End of Old Testament. What is the first thing that happens in the New Testament? A man named John the Baptist shows up who dresses like Elijah. Israel's problem was still wasn't solved. It took some time for it to reach the appointed time in history, but then God finally, fully intervened to solve Israel's greatest problem, their sin. Because what is the Old Covenant? The Old Covenant was the law on Mount Sinai, right? The law outside of you written on tablets of stone. What's the New Covenant? The, the prophets told us. The New Covenant is the law written inside of you, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. The Old Covenant is the Spirit. The, old, the New Covenant is the Spirit. The New Covenant is God changing us to be what we can't be on our own. Obedient to God. Changing people from the inside out to all who would believe in Jesus. And so, if we're honest, <clears throat> in many ways we're a lot more like the Israelites than we'd like to admit. And Nehemiah left and they returned to their evil practices, the very things they said that they, they weren't going to do. And if you ever wonder if your pastor is too heavy-handed, I have yet to pull out anybody's hair in this church. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> he flips out, y'all, because it's that serious. So what's the lesson? The lesson is that, let's just put it this way. There's always a tendency to revert back to the old and familiar. You understand what I'm saying? There are, there's live, then things tend to follow the path of least resistance. And what is least resistance is doing what I've always been doing. That's most least resistant. We tend to, we tend to gravitate there. And so what did the people need? They needed accountability, right? They needed to develop new habits. They needed to do, do the spiritual work, if you will, not just out there, but in their hearts. Recommit themselves to Scripture. Think about it. Dwell on it. To the Word changes their hearts, changes their perspectives, enabling them to change their, their thought patterns, to change their habits, to change the very fabric of who they are. The Word and the Spirit do this together. When you read the word, when you hear the word preached, when you talk about it in Bible study and discipleship groups and Sunday school and that word and you, and you dwell on it and you believe that God is speaking to you through that word and you apply it to your life and you say, you know what? I need to stop thinking like that because the Bible says that's a lie. I need to stop doing that because the Bible says that's wrong. And I need to start, and you start praying for the mind of Christ. God begins to reshape you and, and you can change. God can change you. You can become a different person. Can anybody give witness? 
You cannot think the way you used to think. You cannot do the things you used to do. You can change the habits because the Spirit of God who's in you by the power of the Word and the Spirit and, account- and spiritual accountability, which is all throughout the Bible, come together and those things have a withering effect on your sin. So if you put yourself under the Scripture, you put yourself in spiritual community and accountability, you put yourself in prayer and in the people of God, your sin over time just begins to weaken and, and, and melt before the power of God and the Holy Spirit within you and you become a different person. That's what, we, And that's the difference, right, between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that we have something they don't and that is the Holy Spirit of God. So when we do that and put ourselves under that, God works and God changes us. So then, so then what? So then we don't have to go back to the way we used to be. You don't have to go back. We can stay watchful and we can watch God work for his kingdom and for his glory. Y'all, I'm, I'm super excited about the future of our church and I hope you are too. There's a lot of there's a lot of craziness out there. And the truth is, is despite what you see on the news, there's a lot of people out there that they're not sure what to think. And this is an opportunity for the church to step in and say, hey, this may sound weird. This may sound old fashioned, but let me tell you some good old ancient truth. Not 1776 ancient, about 30 A.D. ancient. A man lived, a man died, a man rose from the dead, and that man is coming back. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you bow your heart and your head and your life before him, he will lift it up and make you into who you were made to be and give you life and meaning and purpose and and create in you and through you a life that will matter, not just for 20, 40, 50, 60 years, but for eternity. When we stay watchful and watch God work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love for us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity that you have placed before us, God, as we step out of the boat, Lord, and and seek you. And, Lord, we're humbled and we're grateful and we're a little scared. Lord, we need you to do what we cannot do. We need you to lead us through this. We need you to lift up our eyes, God, to see the harvest. Lift up our eyes, God, to see the opportunity that is before us. Give us determination, God, not to be thrown off course. Help us to pick up our sword and our trowel, God, and get to work for you. Lord, I'll be the first to confess that I'm a lot more like these Israelites than I'd like to admit. Lord, guard us from reverting back to our old old sin, old ways, old self, God. Keep us on course by the power of your Holy Spirit. Show us the way, God that we may walk in it. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.